Yes, we are finally at the geological period that everyone has heard of. Mostly thanks to some film series that I forget the name of. I heard Samuel Jackson was in it, but apparently he doesn't call anyone a motherfucker, so I didn't bother seeing it. Anyway, let's take a look at everything that happened during the Jurassic. So the term Jurassic is a famous one that instantly conjures images of prehistoric worlds and was first coined in 1829 by Alexander Brognart when he wrote about the stratigraphic succession found by Alexander von Humboldt 34 years prior in the Jura Mountains on the France-Switzerland border. Then over the next 30 years, various geologists and paleontologists would then further refine and divide the Jurassic based on various strata and fossil content. Now the start of the Jurassic can be seen preceding the end Triassic extinction event, which I explain here, 201.4 million years ago. Now this was a pretty crucial time as it marks the beginning of the end for Earth's last supercontinent so far, Pangaea, which had been the only giant landmass for the last 135 million years. The start of this was the breakup of North America from Africa, creating the northern continent of Laurasia and the southern continent of Gondwana. The Panthalassar Ocean, which had once taken up most of Earth, was now beginning to thin as these continents broke up even further, with Laurasia splitting up and moving further north. As Panthalassar was stretched out, the three main plates that made it up moved away from each other. A new plate would actually form to film this empty intersection, which we now call the Pacific, all whilst the Tethys Sea was growing slowly but surely in size. The plate tectonics actually characterised the Jurassic in terms of geology thanks to this whole breakup of the land masses, with lots of normal faults and rifting seen all over the place. And if you're wondering what the hell a fault is, then you can find out more about that in my faults video after you've done watching this one. We also see a lot of shallow marine sediments where there was once land, meaning that the sea levels were actually rising throughout the Jurassic, which was further splitting up any sort of solid land to walk on. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, then you might have figured out why I go through the geography of the planet first, since this kind of shake-up can have really profound effects on the climate and also create starker contrasts in terms of the ecosystems and in turn life. First, let's talk about climate. Now, given the volcanic event known to have created the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which is theorised to have caused the Antarctic extinction, average mean global temperatures sat at around 5 to 10 degrees Celsius higher than today, with CO2 being four times higher, continuing the Mesozoic greenhouse. But it wasn't quite as simple as that during the Jurassic, since we do actually see multiple cold and hot spikes thanks to some smaller igneous events, and possibly better thermocirculation thanks to the ocean being able to get to more places. Speaking of which, the mega monsoons of the last two periods had finally settled down and the seasonality had decreased dramatically as we get closer to the equator. Now remember, the ocean has really profound effects in terms of regulating the climate on land, which is why places in Africa go through wet and dry seasons and places like, say, the UK experience Rain. It's just rain. Like all the time. So with that, what kind of life actually popped up? Well, the flora of the Jurassic saw most of its changes thanks to the change in geography, since it was pretty much unaffected by the end Triassic extinction. Thanks to the settling of climates, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, conifers went through a massive biodiversification event and ended up dominating much of the land, including the very first cypress and pine trees. Along with conifers, we also see the widely adaptive ginkgo owls and benatai tails. As we travel south to more tropical climates though, we see what we often very much associate with the Mesozoic world, cycads. Now even though cycads have been around since the end of the Carboniferous, they reach peak diversity during this time. Though their dominance has often been overestimated thanks to being mistaken for Benatar tails and other families within the cycad-like foliation. Ryan, plants are boring as f talk about things that eat each other. Alright. Well, first let's jump back into the sea. Marine life got the worst of it during the Triassic extinction, 
with up to 72% of genera becoming extinct. Coral and sponge reefs were hit hard but had a brief comeback in the late Jurassic, while crinoids had a steady increase along with bryozoans, brachiopods and bivalves, with a higher abundance of the famous Gryphaea or Devil's Toenail. The Jurassic also saw a great time for crustaceans, especially the decapods. It's here in the early Jurassic that we see the first true crabs, with them diversifying throughout into modern groups like hermit crabs. Cephalopods also made a pretty good comeback. Ammonites especially were hit hard at the end of the Triassic, but absolutely exploded in the early Jurassic, making this time famous for its ammonites. This is also when we see the very first octopuses. Moving on to fish, freshwater lungfish were plodding along as they always had, or swimming along, and ray finned fish soon spread out to freshwater and marine environments around the world. When it comes to the cartilaginous fish, many archaic forms such as the hybodonts were being taken over by more modern groups, such as the Neosilaki, which contained sharks and rays. Marine reptiles, on the other hand, exploited the stage they had been laying in the Triassic. Another thing that the Jurassic is famous for is its marine reptiles, thanks in significant part to the famous fossil hunter Mary Anning, who, by the way, deserves a whole video to herself, which will be coming out very, very soon. Maybe subscribe so you don't miss it. Ichthyosaurs were at their peak in the early Jurassic, filling many niches, including the apex predator, Temnodontosaurus, but seem to have lost their touch by the late Jurassic, with most groups having become extinct. Plesiosaurs, on the other hand, fared a bit better. Despite some groups dying off in the end Triassic, they started the Jurassic fairly diverse and we see a high turnover of groups in the mid-Jurassic with the dawn of more short-necked giants like Liopleurodon. Turtles were also pushing forward with modern groups appearing in the late Jurassic along with some new groups such as the Rhynchocephalians, a sister group to Squamates, which I'll get more onto in a minute, and many of these groups were aquatic. As we step more firmly onto land, we see that the amphibians were doing... meh with only less amphibians showing any real diversification. Pseudosuchians, on the other hand, were humbled by the end Triassic extinction. Gone were the strange and monstrous terrestrial aetosaurs and Rausuchians, and only crocodilomorphs remained, most of which were semi-aquatic. But even though they confined themselves to semi-aquatic lifestyles similar to today, they did actually show a lot more diversification in terms of niche dominance than modern crocs with even some herbivorous species. Now for the fully terrestrial animals. Insects and arachnids, as interesting as they are, aren't really worth mentioning here because we see more or less the same groups that we see today. Sorry, invertebrate fans. You suck. But terrestrial vertebrates were doing something very interesting. Do you remember I mentioned squamates a minute ago? Well, squamates are the group of reptiles that include lizards and snakes. And yes, the term lizard encompasses far less than you think, and they are a lot less related to other reptiles than you think as well. Apart from mosasaurs, but I'll get more into that in my Cretaceous video. Anyway, true squamates first appeared in the early Jurassic as small insectivore lizards, many of which lived an arboreal lifestyle. Living a similar lifestyle were many mammals, but not all of them. We often think of mammals as being the Mesozoic underdogs just because they never got big, but they actually showed some really high diversification during the Jurassic. Therians first appeared here and you had Frutifosa, an aardvark-like animal, the Laticotherium, which could glide with a skin membrane, and the semi-aquatic Castoracorda, which lived an otter-like lifestyle. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's it. Catch you guys next time. No, no, sorry, sorry, there was some other groups called Pterosaurs and Dinosaurs. So we know that the group, the Avometatarsalia, had made themselves known during the Triassic. But the age of the dinosaurs hadn't actually started yet, since they didn't dominate with those pesky Pseudosuchians in their way. With them gone at the start of the Jurassic though, nothing stood in their way. The pterosaurs took full advantage of those empty skies and diversified into the Ramphorhynchids, 
the adorable anaerognathids, the morphodontids and the pterodactyloids, which would give rise to more recognisable species in the Cretaceous. And dinosaurs just went balls to the wall. Theropods, the two-legged ones, started off as basal as they were during the Triassic, with guys like Dracoraptor and the famous Dilophosaurus. But these guys were soon lost amongst the Averostra, or what I call the big boys. This clade contains the Ceratosaurs, which include Ceratosaurus, Spinostrophius, and Elaphrosaurus, but later would give rise to Cretaceous groups like the Abelosaurids. The other group of Averostra was the Tetanure, which is basically all other theropods, meaning they would later give rise to Cretaceous groups like Tyrannosaurs and Spinosaurs. But in the Jurassic, we see groups that include the likes of the very first dinosaur ever discovered, Megalosaurus, and everyone's favourite Jurassic apex predator, Allosaurus. Paleo profile was coming soon. Another group of Tetanurans that had humble beginnings but would show remarkable resilience was the Silurosauria. Silurosaurs are a group of theropods that include the Ornithomimosaurs, Manoraptorans, the aforementioned Tyrannosaurs, and birds. Now, I know we think of birds as the modern group of dinosaurs, but in truth, Silurosaurs like the Tyrannosaurs or Ornithomimids didn't actually show up until the Cretaceous. Manoraptorans, however, diversified hugely during the Jurassic into Truodontids, very primitive Dromaeosaurs, weird bat-like dinosaurs like Yi Chi, and birds, showcased by the famous missing link from the late Jurassic that shows both avian and non-avian dinosaur traits, Archaeopteryx. So birds aren't just modern dinosaurs, they're actually one of the oldest lineages. Uh, enough fanboying about theropods, what about the others? Well, the other group of Ceriscians, the sauropods, had moved well on from their bipedal ancestors. The first known giant quadrupedal sauropods seem to have stemmed from Africa, such as Volcanodon and Lidu Mahadi, with various groups also coming in from East Laurasia in time before Pangaea broke up. Come the late Jurassic, they diversified and become giant, likely in part due to the increased temperatures. And if you're a little bit confused as to what kind of difference the temperature can make for an animal size, I do go into that here. This is where we see famous faces like Mementiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Brachiosaurus, and Diplodocus, dominating as the undisputed giant herbivores of the world. We also see huge success with the other herbivores and the other half of Dinosauria, the Ornithischians. Small Ornithischians such as Lysothosaurus and Heterodontosaurus were bipedal herbivores during the early Jurassic, but larger groups appeared during the early to mid-Jurassic, such as the Thyreophorians or armoured dinosaurs. The basal members of this group include Scutillosaurus from the US and Scalidosaurus from the UK. But these Thyreophorians became a lot more recognisable when they diverged into Ankylosaurs and Stegosaurs. Stegosaurus itself is known for the Morrison Formation in North America and was known to tussle with Allosaurus. And also, if you can really put up with my cringy, God, he's trying too hard voice from years ago, I do also have a paleo profile on Stegosaurus here. So we're finally seeing a true dinosaur dominated world come the end of the Jurassic. We have giant sauropods, hypercarnivores, pterosaurs soaring the skies, and oceans filled with ammonites, sharks, and marine reptiles as the dons. Now it's normally at this point in the video where I'll say, and then everything died again, but this isn't actually the case for once. Geological periods in history are bookended with major faunal changes, usually thanks to an extinction. Now this was thought to be the case at first with the end Jurassic, but it turns out there wasn't really much of an extinction event so much as a major faunal turnover. Now certain marine invertebrate groups did go extinct, but the event was minor and new groups replaced them quickly enough. What's probably worse was the Tawashian Oceanic Anoxic event in the early Jurassic, which only really affected a few groups of marine invertebrates. So outside of a few minor changes, most of life on Earth was actually okay by the end of the Jurassic. 
free to go about their business and evolve into forms that we might find a little bit more familiar in the next period. But you'll have to find out more about that next time.